Let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 23. We've been looking, of course, into the life of David, uh, facing Goliath. This lesson is lesson, uh, what's lesson seven of the book. I don't know how many weeks we've been looking at it, a lot more than seven. Uh, we've done at least three lessons, uh, three class periods for each lesson in the book. I know one we did four. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of the way it works sometimes. The material, I think, is just too good to rush through. Amen. Amen. I was working on the message for this morning. I've been working on it throughout the week and, and uh, for the Sunday, school, Sunday morning message. And uh, that in the study went from one message to at least four, probably five. Uh, just too much, too much good stuff to rush through. Amen. And uh, you ever had one of those meals where you just wanted to go slow and just savor every bite? I think sometimes in our Christian life, we hurry through it. You know, I saw a picture this week of a fellow that was, he was out on a boat out in the ocean somewhere. I mean, it was, you know, off the bay somewhere. And um, he's sitting there and there's this beautiful whale coming up out of the water right next to his boat. The picture was taken from another boat. And here's the guy on the bow of his ship. And never saw this beautiful creature coming up out of the water. Never saw it. And a little film clip of it, the thing's going along, and he never took his eyes off his phone. Take that phone and chunk it in the water. Look at what God's made. Amen. How many times in our Christian life we get so busy, distracted by what's around us, we don't take time to look at what God has for us. And so this morning as we get into the scriptures, I I want us to just look at some some elements that I think that will be a help to us. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, at, at the life of David and specifically as David's <clears throat> ability to, uh, to deal with those that were against him. As we've seen, Saul was very much against him. In Matthew 5, the Bible says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Those are easy verses to read, but they're extremely difficult to live. And so uh, this week, we're going to look at some things about that. They're in, in uh, 1 Samuel, and let's see, we're in chapter number 24, I believe is where I had to go. And uh, we'll start there in verse number 1, and uh, we'll read um, down through all probably around uh, verse number 12. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And it came to pass, I'm sorry, he came to the, uh, the sheep goats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in uh, to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it seemeth good to thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also rose up afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou uh, men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, uh, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou, and seest that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, because I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Let's pray and we'll get into our lesson. Heavenly Father, as we look into this subject of dealing with our enemies, would you help us to see the example of David? Would you help us as believers to, to learn 
to love our enemies and to treat them the way you would have us to treat them. Would you teach us from thy word this morning? Give us grace. Give us understanding, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week as we, we looked at, or two weeks ago as we looked at David, we looked at his forgiveness. As over and over again Saul had come against him, and there was no reason for Saul to be against David. Saul had in his mind that David was against him, and that could be the, that, that's the farthest thing from the truth. David supported and was loyal and defended the king over and over again. He did everything the king asked him to do. We saw that David forgave him even when he was done evil by Saul. Uh, and you know, that's a difficult thing as believers for us to deal with. In Ephesians 4 verse 32, it says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Uh, the measure of our forgiveness is not dependent upon us. It's dependent on how much God forgave us. When we look at it in that light, it changes the entire equation. And David here, he is learning to forgive. We saw he forgave from the start. If, you, if you're looking in your books, lesson number, uh, in the first part of the lesson, uh, the, the first big point, Roman number one, David's forgiveness. Letter A, he forgave from the start. Uh, at the very beginning, when Saul was against him, David forgave him. He kept coming back and obeying the king. Uh, we saw that he forgave from his heart uh, in 1 Samuel 19. Uh, verses 8 through 10. After Saul had tried to kill David, he continued to serve the king. After the king had thrown a javelin at him once, he came back again in the same setting, put himself in the same place because there was nothing in his heart against the king. Now you and I, we'd go in there with bodyguards and armor and weapons, and, but that's not the way David approached it. He approached it with forgiveness from his heart. And this morning I want us to see the next stage of this. As, as David here in, in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, he's running from Saul, he's hiding in a cave, and it just so happens that King Saul comes in the same cave to go to sleep. Where it says he covered his feet. He's talking about he's, he's laying down, he's, taking, he's sleeping through the night, and he, he covers himself and he looks out. Uh, I, I mean, David looks out and in the same cave where he and his men are hiding, there's King Saul. Now humanly speaking, we would respond just like his men. Well, there's the guy that's against you. David, now's your chance. I mean, he, you know, and of course we see in the story, he gets close enough to take his sword and cut off part of Saul's clothes while he sleeps. He must have been a heavy sleeper. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I, ever, ever, when I read this chapter, I'm wondering what happens to Saul's bodyguards after this. Yeah. <laughs> they let David right up to him and let David pull his sword. And they didn't do anything because they were sleeping. Somebody probably lost their head that day. And, uh, but, but David, he, he has this opportunity. And David does some things in this chapter I believe will help us. If you've got your notes there in your books, Roman numeral 2, David's respectfulness. David's respectfulness. And we're talking about David's attitude towards someone who has set his entire kingdom to destroy him. Look, it says that he brought 3,000 of his chosen men to seek David and his men. It's what it says in verse 2. And this isn't just Saul in a personal vendetta. He's enlisting his army. He got his chosen soldiers. These are probably his elite troops. These are the best guys he has. And he's got them going after uh, the, uh, the one person that he hates. I mean, he, he enlisted the Navy SEALs. Oh, by the way, be praying about this. And we, we're arranging some things for a God and Country service in September. Looks like we're going to have a Navy SEAL here that day. And a friend of ours that, uh, let me just say this, you don't want to mess with him. Amen. He looks like a surfer dude from L.A. Because that's what he was before he joined the Navy. And uh, now he's, uh, he's a Navy SEAL. It's interesting when he happens to be gone. Big things happen around the world when he's gone. Uh, but anyway, uh, these guys are tough men. These 3,000 chosen men, they're with Saul. And they're after David. And David responds in a different way. It's interesting. We live in a day in which this generation seems that you don't have to respect anybody. There is no respect. I mean, just watch how the news media, and it has been the news media, and a couple of, uh, of, of troublemakers in our country have stirred up entire cities against our police force. You know, I want to attack all the police. Are all police officers perfect? No, none of them are perfect. But I'm sure glad they're around. Amen. Uh, next time you're in trouble and you're afraid somebody's going to kill you, who you call, you're dialing 911. Who are you hoping to show up? 
The police, what do we got? We've got an entire generation now that shows no respect for those men who put their life on the line to protect them. It's the same towards our military. And uh, uh, it's interesting in our, in this week, Brother Shemesh, who was from Australia, he pastored in Brisbane for many years. He now is a missionary to uh, Thailand. He admonished us. He exhorted us. He said, I'm seeing something in America that I did not see when I first came 25 years ago. And I'm seeing independent Bible-believing Christians who say they love God, want to obey God, and they're disrespecting the man God put in office as your president. You ain't got about that quiet in our room, too. It's tough, Brother Shaw, when a foreigner is telling us how we're supposed to behave. And he's right. Amen goes right there. And we'll see that a little bit more in the scriptures as we get, get a little further. But he's talking about the lack of respect towards a position that God ordained. You know, so we don't like that. Well, I don't like the person in the office. Well, I don't either. We'll talk about that a little later in the message, but that doesn't mean we're not supposed to respect him. Here's David and a king that God has already rejected, a king that God has already told David, I'm going to replace his kingdom with yours. Yet David shows him great respect. Look at verse number 6. We see the first thing about him. Uh, and, and it says, And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. His, if you look at letter A, his words were respectful. Notice what he says about this man who is out to destroy him. A man who's brought 3,000 of his best soldiers to kill him. David says three things about him. He calls him his master. And he said uh, in verse number 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing against my master. Then he calls him the Lord's anointed and the anointed of the Lord. Now compare that with the language you use uh, 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 describing the people that are against you. See, David did forgive. And with that forgiveness came a respectfulness. He is showing us if we're going to love our enemies, we've got to be careful what we say. Uh, keep your place here, but let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I read one of these verses a minute ago, but I want us all to see them. Ephesians 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 29. We're talking about how we, how we talk about those that are against us. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And an interesting here, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Then God defines what he means by that. You don't need a dictionary. You don't need Webster's 1828 to figure it out. Just read your Bible. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Then he puts a comma, but that which is good to the use of edifying. You know what that word edifying means? It means to build up. I'm going to quote my son, Zach. He had a sermon he used to preach on this one. And he says there, that word edify means to build up. So if what you've got to say doesn't build up, shut up. That's a little harsh language, but you get the point. If it's corrupt communication, that means you know, we're always thinking, well, it's cussing. No, if it's something that doesn't build them up, that's criticism. That's slander. It's backbiting. That's corrupt communication. It doesn't encourage them. That which it says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That means those that hear you watch and in, in, in are in receiving grace, that which is not earned. So we don't know what they did to me. Well, I know what King Saul was trying to do to David. He was trying to kill him. I mean, I don't think anybody in this room has had anybody throw a javelin at us lately. I mean, I have some people that tell me they don't like me, but none of them have gotten 3,000 trained soldiers and encamped outside my house. I'd sick Maggie on them. She'd lick them to death. Last night, because we've been gone for a week and nobody's played with her like we normally do, um, she was not happy. She, she only knows how to play with one item, a rope bone. It's the only thing she knows how to play with. 
She wants to wrestle with you and wants you to throw it across the house. And last night she came and had her mouth and was growling and barking at me with it in her mouth. She was not happy. And I tried to get it from her. She's like, and just like, whoa, calm down. That's who I'll sick on them. You know, then she'll lay on the couch and watch them carry everything out. But I don't have anybody coming after me with an army. David did. And he was respectful in his words to them. I'm talking about that person at work, your supervisor that you really like working for. <laughs> Using a little bit of sarcasm right there. You know that one that every day sends you those emails and notes, how much they appreciate all the stuff you do for the company. They give you all the best time off and, you know, come by every day to pat you on the back so you're doing a great job. That one. Well, maybe they don't do quite that. Maybe they're the one that just every day they do whatever they can to get under your skin. They always promote somebody else over you because of who you are, that you're a believer. Maybe just your personalities don't get along. You ever had somebody like that that just, it's like oil and water? You ever had a boss like that? My hand's up. I've, I've had some of those where every day I told my wife, I hate going to work. I love going to work now. My boss is wonderful. So who's your boss? The Lord. And the retirement package is out of this world, amen? But, but you've got that, that person at work that's just, they know your buttons and they push them all day long. It's kind of like that commercial where this kid, his, you know, the, these guys are making all these, these uh, encyclopedias. Remember that commercial about a year ago? And uh, they're, they're, they're firing up the printing presses, they're printing them all. And like, man, their orders are coming in like crazy. And there's this little kid with his mom's iPad going, buy, 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 buy. And just, you know, one of those, they know how to push your button. Anybody had one of those? How do you respond to them? You see, David, he responded with grace. You're there in the New Testament. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. This is a tough verse. I'll tell you before we get there. Matthew 12. This is one none of us are going to like because it's so difficult to live. Matthew 12. The verse we're going to get to is verse 36, but let's start in verse number 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. For a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's tough. God's recording every word. I remember when I was in San Diego, I was, I was called to jury duty. Anybody ever had jury duty? I was on a civil trial for four weeks. It's a lawsuit, and I was juror number two. And uh, sitting right there taking my notes every day. And I learned all kinds of things about the judicial system. They did not teach me in civics class. I learned all kinds of stuff. And uh, they had the fellow that was bringing the lawsuit, suing the big company. And it uh, had to do with that he had, he had bought uh, a gas station. What he'd actually bought was the, the, uh, the, the lease on the land because he didn't own the land. He was leasing the building. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, he did own the land, but he did own the building. And uh, he was suing the, the Chevron oil company over uh, this. He was trying to get the, la the buildings on the land for free and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, he, there was some problems on the land where some of those tanks had begun to leak. They do that. They have to change them every so often. And so the EPA had come out and had done some ground testing. And the value of his land went down. And he was suing to get him a whole bunch of money back. And... Uh, he had in the conversation when they had him on the stand one day they were asking him well did you know anything about ground contamination and they used all these words and described well he said oh i've never heard of that i didn't know anything about it until we were in this trial and, well have you ever gone down to the the county office or the city office that shows what's happened on every piece oh no i've never been down there oh really and so they bring up this this piece of paper they, they bring up it had on a big screen of the log 
in the city building where you go in to investigate property and whether or not these exact things were done to it. And there it showed on a date, his name, his signature, the time he checked in, the time he checked out, and what documents he read. And the attorney that was with him was listed there. And they held up, is that your name? Well, yes. Is that your signature? Uh, yes. So you read those documents? Well, I guess so. But you just told me you didn't, that you've never heard of them. And then they said, let's bring up your deposition from two years ago. And they bring up this video deposition. And he had been asked that question before and gave an exact opposite answer. And they went, they, they, as they were playing the video, they were showing the transcript word by word. You know, the little, the little bouncy ball go on, you know. <laughs> he said, so are those your words? Yes. So were you lying then or are you lying now? The trial was over right then. I mean, it, it, I mean, it went a f another week, but it, as a jurors, we're like, it's done. <laughs> I mean, it was clear. You, you realize what those verses just told us? God's got one of those. Every idle word. David, in responding to King Saul, he calls him my master. How can you call somebody your master who's tried to kill you twice? The Lord's anointed. The anointed of the Lord. You see, David is showing great respect. What, the, what an opposite to what Saul had showed to David. Here David is modeling for us how we're supposed to behave when someone does wrong against us. Um, Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 75. We've got to understand, as David talks about, you know, King Saul being uh, his master and the Lord's anointed, David understood <coughs> that God had made Saul king. You understand that Saul was not on a, he didn't go on a campaign and get voted in as king. You do understand that. The nation of Israel went to God and begged for a king when he didn't want him to have one. And then God chose Saul, who was hiding among the stuff. He was very humble. God later says, when you were small in your eyes, I could bless you. Look at Psalm 75. We'll look at verses 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. That's why I said a little earlier, that's how we know President Obama is president this morning because God made him so. That's Bible. Uh, we'll look at, in just a moment, we'll go to the book of Romans uh, where, where the Bible tells us that, that every authority is ordained of God and they are ministers of God. That one hurts. You know, God called um, um, Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Nebuchadnezzar, the one who took Israel captive, who built the idol. God called him my servant. Why? Because God made him king and God was going to use him. David understood that if Saul was king, he was so because God ordained it. And so David was okay with recognizing this man was put in his position by God and I will respect him because of God. David knew God had not made a mistake in choosing Saul as king. Saul had chosen to rebel against God. And he needed to respect God's choice no matter what. David understood the sovereignty of God. We're so conditioned in our society that we want it our way. And we want our plan and our, uh, our purpose and we want it when we want it and David understood, no, God's in charge of this, not me. We see that his words were respectful. Let's go back to 1 Samuel, chapter number 24. And we'll see beyond his words is something else that he displayed for us. Verse number 8. And David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My lord the king... 
And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the ground, and, or to, his, to the earth, and bowed himself, and said unto Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but that mine hand shall not be upon thee. As, the, as saith the prophet of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. For after whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. We see as David comes here, he, he finds Saul sleeping in a cave. And he now has an opportunity to take things into his own hands. How many times do we do that? There's an opportunity. And just because there's an opportunity does not mean it's of the Lord. Right. David's men are like, look, the Lord's delivered him into your hand. You get to take care of the problem. It wasn't David's job to take care of the problem. Because Saul was not his servant. Saul was God's servant. David had an opportunity, and David did pull out his sword and cut off the robe, and then he says later, I shouldn't have done that. But David, who had forgiven Saul, continued to trust God and refused to try to rush God's timetable. And he left Saul unharmed. I wonder, are you willing to let God do what He wants in your life when He wants to? Or do you want to take it into your hand? David had been anointed king. He was going to be the king of Israel. He was going to be a great king. But it wasn't time yet. David understood that was in God's hand. And so because of that, he was willing to forgive King Saul. And in that forgiveness, he was willing to show him the mercy that King Saul was not showing him. He was showing him grace. And he modeled that for us, not just forgiveness, but respectfulness. He treated him well. You know, several times David speaks of not putting his hand against the Lord's anointing. He does it back in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel. Just turn over a page or two in your Bibles. Look at verse number 9. We see in... Um, in the context of this chapter, David is again with Saul. and uh, He says in verse number 8, and Abishai, Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once. And I will smite him, uh, I will not smite him the second time. He's telling him, I'm going to take care of this. You won't have to worry about this, king. I'll take care of it. And David said unto Abishai, Destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? He said, that man belongs to God. I'm not touching him. Go down, if you will, to verse 11. Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee take now the spear that is in, thine, uh, thy bolster, uh, that is in his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So he takes some things from Saul. So Saul will know we were there. We could have taken your life, but we did not. Look at verse 23. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord did deliver thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. See, not only were his words respectful, but his actions were respectful. Over and over again, David could have taken things in his hand. In fact, in, in this chapter, if you read chapter 26, when, uh, when David's in the wilderness of Ziph uh, and Saul comes after him, uh, the Bible says that a deep sleep from the Lord came upon Saul. God made him sleep so deep he wouldn't wake up. So why in the world would he do that and let David be there? I think he was letting David show Saul how you're supposed to behave when someone's done something against you. 
And he models that for us. See, the scripture is telling us we're to recognize the sovereignty of God and the power, the people he puts in positions of power over us. Now let's go to Romans chapter 13. We'll come back here to 1 Samuel, Romans 13. Look at verse number 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. He's telling us we're to render to their dues. Look at verse number 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So I just want to think about your life and, the, and the, the people in positions of authority over you. I'm talking about your boss, I'm talking about your mayor, I'm talking about your senators, your governor, your president. They're in that position because God put them there. That's hard for us to come to grips with sometimes because we don't like the person in the office. But the office is ordained of God and He put them there. See, we look at things from a different perspective than our God does. We look at things in periods of today. What, what's going to happen today? And In fact, that's why most politicians get elected is because they appeal to people today. But you understand, even with that, God's still in charge. He lets people see what they need to see. God doesn't look at things today. He doesn't even look at a year. He doesn't look just at generations. He looks at all time and He's got a plan. He's working His plan. You see, when we put into practice this opportunity of, of, of giving honor to whom honor is due and showing respect, it gives us an opportunity to influence them. If David had constantly responded to Saul the way Saul had responded to him, David would never have an opportunity to influence him. Think of this. King, think of, of uh, Saul of Tarsus. We know him as Apostle Paul. In the book of Acts, he has a debate. The other person in the debate is a man you might have heard of, uh, Stephen, the first martyr. They get done with that and they, they, they lay their coats down at the feet of Saul and they stone Stephen to death. And in that whole time, Stephen is very respectful. He asks God, lay not this sin to their charge. And here's Saul. A couple chapters later, he's going to meet Jesus Christ. And he responds to the Lord Jesus. Why? I believe part of it is because how he watched Stephen respond to being treated incorrectly. I believe that Saul of Tarsus, uh, before he got saved, I believe he was at the, the trial of Christ. And I don't have time to go into all that. I believe he was there. I can't prove it, but I think he was. He was one of the devout men. He had to be in Israel at the time. He was there. For all of those feasts, he was, he, he was one of the rulers. If he wasn't there, he at least knew about it. And no doubt had heard how Jesus responded on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Instead of responding by calling fire down out of heaven or calling 12 legions of angels, our Savior submitted to the will of the Father and learned obedience. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews. Why? That he might be our Redeemer. Later on, Saul of Tarsus gets saved and everything changes. Why? Because there was a believer that showed him this is how believers act. I wonder who is it in your life that they're, they're against you, they're evil. Evil, when you see the scripture talking about someone's evil, that means doing wrong with the intent to harm. Saul was evil. I'm talking about King Saul. He was evil. He wanted to harm David. And David had done nothing wrong. I wonder how many people in our lives that they're, 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 they're wrong, they're evil. And you say, why are they that way? Because they're lost. Why are we shocked that lost people act like lost people? How did you act before you got saved? We still struggle with it after we got saved. We have the Holy Spirit inside. We have a new nature. They don't. But I wonder how many of those people would get saved if they saw a believer act like a believer. Show them how to respond. you imagine the impact this had to have on David's men as they watched him respond to Saul? 
But time after time, like, come on, David, let's kill him. No, that's God's anointed. You leave him alone. And he showed us that we're to behave in such a way that it shows respect to them. We see David's forgiveness in his respect for us. We may not always agree with the authority over us. Our authority may not always make decisions that are right according to the scriptures. But God still commands us to respect the authority. When I was talking with Brother Brad Wells, as he's there in D.C., and one of the things that he said that God's having to help him with is he's in, and he's in the, the, the federal buildings and he's, he's around the congressmen. It's one of the things he's got to do. He'll see somebody that he knows is bringing up bills and proposed laws that would hurt us and, as believers. He said, but I'm there to show them respect and honor so that I have an opportunity to give them the gospel. I wonder who is it we could reach in our lives if we would respond in forgiveness and respectfulness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the example of David. Father, as we've looked at this morning how we're supposed to behave, these are difficult things to live. We need your help to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not our nature. Our human nature wants to lash out and respond, but you gave us the example yourself. That when you were reviled, you reviled not again. May we learn to be forgiving. May we learn to be respectful. May we keep the, the relationship in such a way we have an opportunity to influence them for right. May we not get caught up in the name calling and the mean spirit. May we stand for right, but may we do it in such a way that we still have opportunity to proclaim that right, to proclaim truth. Help us to be forgiving, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.